I will certainly give you what you want. You want to hear about Belgian beer? We'll get to that. No problem. But I um, did my um, I do my lecture in a, in a larger context. I try to put it also in a cultural context. And so um, I start with this. This is very important um, for any country in the world. How do you like to be seen by the rest of the world? And of course, you like to be seen from a technological point of view with vibrant cities, very modern. I don't. This is Rotterdam, actually, for some who visited, it, uh, with a strong economy, and whatever uh, that takes uh, to build. And um, you know, this is a warehouse uh, directly uh, inputs with uh, IT and things like that. But then again, the the rest of the world sees this country because it's, these were all buildings uh, and sites in Holland, uh, our, our neighbors. This is how, one way or the other, a country is still seen. Eh? And, and it's, it's, it's a little bit to the... Um, um, it, it's, it's not always um, nice to be uh, reduced to the archetypes, eh? uh, the, the cloths, the, the cheese and the tulps, but that's the way, just, just the way it is. And we have also the same thing. <laughs> we can talk about whatever economy we have or other things, but this is the way uh, you, from an American or from an Asian or from another perspective, see it. This is not a bad way to be seen. And so my point is, if you, if, if this is the way that the rest of the world uh, has, a, has a view of you, uh, you might, uh, you can better uh, do uh, on, on your marketing and your communication on these elements the best. Uh, the best you can and as professional as possible. But let's not talk about beer immediately because beer is a serious thing in our country. Uh, it is something that is shared by many people and you can really uh, put it into a cultural tradition. It's just, it's not a mere beverage, it's more. Huh? And uh, you know, of course, that um, we have an old tradition of our Flemish master. That is a, 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 um, art piece of Bruegel, eh? Hunters in the Snow, one of the, the finest that he has. Uh, you know, of course, Rubens, eh? which you might uh, admire uh, within a year in the Legion of Honor, uh, with, the, with one of the greatest Rubens expositions of the last uh, 20 years in the West Coast. Eh? And of course, the Ghent altarpiece, the Mystic Lamb, now in, in uh, renovation, restoration, uh, things that go way back. But we have also um, cultural uh, icons that are more recent, and of course you know this this uh, this Mister, uh, this uh, this painter, uh, uh, actually, that is René Magritte, and this probably the most famous uh, painting that he has. I will later on try to explain you what for me the liaisons are between what I showed you about Bruegel and the Belgian surrealism of uh, the first half of the 20th century. It's still not over. We have uh, other things. Uh, if you're into contemporary dance, then Andreas de Keersmaak is certainly one of the world references uh, that you can imagine. Um, some pictures about what she's doing. Uh, world famous star, but also in music. Maybe this is a little bit old school, but this is still a very grand master eh, of his time. Uh, and this one, you know, probably was one of the best. Uh, Friends of Mr. Quincy Jones, uh, which he worked with. And this is maybe the new uh, Jacques Brel, eh, who was uh, not so long ago also in Madison Square Garden, filling, filling the room. And Tomorrowland, I know there are quite some uh, American citizens uh, coming to visit us e each year. There's, there was even an American Tomorrowland. I don't know if that uh, went uh, very well. There, was, there were a little bit of problems. But we are, so to say, an uh, important land of culture. But when it comes to culture, this is, of course, the main part where people are referring to. And um, we took it so far that uh, with all this variety and diversity of, of beers, uh, we got um, to the honorary title of the UNESCO World uh, Heritage. It's, in fact, the, the, the immaterial cultural heritage is not the same as world heritage. World heritage is referring to the actual sites. Uh, but it's the same for the immaterial element. Now, uh, why did we get the UNESCO honorary title, the recognition? Um, it's not because of the beers. Uh, we, we, it's not of, of, the, of the liquid uh, the, as such, not, as the, not, not for the beverage as such. 
because UNESCO wants to um, uh, create a cultural uh, value between uh, people and not uh, talk about the mere economical product. Eh? You know, beer is, is, is always uh, dancing on both legs. Eh? It's an economical product. It has to be sold. Eh? Something it's, It doesn't sell itself. Eh? Sometimes people think uh, it is, but it's an, it's an e economical business like uh, something else. But then again, it's a cultural um, value where people uh, can meet and the UNESCO element is the immaterial one. So uh, referring to the different beer festivals we have in Belgium and eh? the, the, also the Belgian beer festival in um, Brussels in uh, Grand Place, but also the knowledge that is transferred from uh, generation to generation about uh, how to make the best possible beers. Also the collectors uh, of um, glassware and, and things like that. So I'm quite um, proud to say that when I was director at uh, Brewers House in Brussels at the, for the Belgian uh, Brewers Federation, that I introduced this um, application to uh, UNESCO in Paris and that afterwards as a Minister of Culture I could put another signature on the same uh, document <laughs> going on uh, internationally. That was one of the nice, nice moments in, in my life. Okay, let's now put our Belgian beer culture into relationship with other countries. Yeah? Um, this is uh, the actual title for this picture is When Giants Meet. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, it's, uh, it's good to be a, a, a beer country, but there are many uh, emerging beer countries uh, right now, and the USA is definitely one of them. And yesterday we had a great night with uh, many good American beers, many of them Belgian style. And in fact, we can thank an, an important American, a former president, who was responsible for the, um, the, the, the renewal of craft beers. It was Jimmy Carter, actually, who in 1977 um, allowed the home brewing, which was not allowed uh, until that moment. Eh? And in the end of the 70s, many uh, Americans uh, started to brew their own beer and became that good at it that they, uh, they, they, they made a profession about it. And they, they started to uh, run uh, brewery business as, uh, from an eco economical point of view. And that, in fact, um, um, revitalized our, our beer culture too, because many of, them, of the Americans uh, saw our country as a sort uh, um, of site of pilgrimage, where as you are really getting into Belgian beers, you have to visit the, the, the land where it all started. This is interesting just uh, to give you a, a reference. Uh, you see that the, the amount of uh, American breweries over the last uh, 20 years has grown enormously. And even in our country, for a long time, we were stabilized at 100, 130 uh, breweries and now at 200. So in, in a relative way, it's also very important for us. If you take the ratio <coughs> on this uh, beer per uh, capita, we're still a little bit ahead of uh, the United States. Eh? But I must say, when I try to explain what is so special about Belgian beer culture, one of the elements is to say, okay, the, the Americans are now as diverse as the Belgians. And sometimes they brew beers who are uh, as good as ours. I have to admit it before this camera, so uh, no, no problem with that. But the tradition is uh, less uh, deeply rooted, for obvious historical reasons. The Germans are as traditional as us, but they have less lesser diversity. They are more into the, the mainstream, very good pills uh, brewing, eh? the lager uh, style brewing. And we are the only country having the diversity and the tradition. But uh, we have to take into account that other important beer countries are surrounding us. Okay, let's talk about Belgian beer styles. Uh, um, and you know, of course, we also have uh, the lager style, the pill style, but that is not really a typical Belgian style because it uh, came across from Central Europe. And let's say that uh, one of the two things that uh, the Germans uh, left behind after the First World War was the Christmas tree, before we didn't have it in our, uh, in our regions, and uh, the pills beer. It was already there before the First World War, but. Uh, was that good and we adapted it it's less less a little less bitter than the the, the german or the czech style we also have the the wits beers eh? uh, where wheat is used to give a little haziness to the beer and also a little um, sort of a spiciness fruitiness uh, to the to the taste um, the, the the only other country where 
with, uh, with beer or with beer or whites and beer, eh, and, uh, and I'm revealing, of course, what I'm going to say, is also deeply rooted is, is Germany. But the taste of the Weizen beer, uh, Weizen is the German word for wheat, and Weiss is the German word for white, eh, so it comes all, 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 everything comes together. The taste of the, the German uh, Weizen beers is uh, um, um, determined by the yeast, uh, as the um, taste of the Belgian uh, wheat beers is determined by the spices added to, uh, the, uh, to the beer. It's a coriander and it's a curacao uh, and things like that. You have the amber beers, which is a third category. Uh, this is of uh, this is more uh, a Belgian um, uh, reference to British uh, pale ale, eh? but the Belgian uh, amber beers are a little bit more smooth, eh? a little bit more caramelisk, uh, and not uh, that much of uh, hops. We have the Abbey beers and the Trappists. I'm going to talk about a little bit longer about them, of course, uh, within a few slides. And then we have the strong um, golden ales, where, of course, a, a brand like Duvel, but since we, are, since we have the mayor of, of Kortrijk here with us, there's also a beer like Omer. I don't know if you ever drank it, ever tasted it, uh, are uh, highlighting this uh, category. And we have, of course, the sour beers, where in my region, in Brussels, you have the Lambics and the Geuze, eh? but uh, now they are also... Uh, fabricated here in, in the United States. Eh? You know, you should know that uh, the sourness of the beers is mainly provoked by the, the spontaneous yeast that we are all inhuming eh, right now. And before Mr. Louis Pasteur uh, discovered in 1850 the, how to control and how to grow yeast in a more um, scientific way, Every beer in uh, all over the world was with spontaneous yeasting and was often a little bit too sour. Yeah? Uh, it's only afterwards with uh, controlling the, the yeast that we are now uh, in the modern uh, beer cultural age. But fortunate for us in Brussels and in the region around Brussels, some brewers continued to work with the spontaneous uh, yeast and you, you get this little sourness. Uh, it has to be a, a controlled sourness, because if you go too far with it, it becomes uh, acid, acid, and it becomes vinegar, and it's not that good. There are some American brewers, I must say, who really get a kick from as acid as possible, and I say, sorry guys, but this is not beer for me, this is just putting as much uh, yeast aggressively into the beer, and it's interesting, but I won't take a second glass. Huh? Uh, but this being said, uh, for instance, the guys in uh, Allegash, I think is in a brewery in Vermont, if I'm uh, well informed. Yeah. They are making, main, 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 yeah, right. They are um, making quite good uh, lambics, and, uh, and you see that the spontaneous yeast, which is in the air everywhere in the world, differs from region to region. You have this slightly almond touch in the uh, Allegash lambic, which we don't have in, in, in Brussels. Huh? So it's interesting, we have a whole, lot, a whole world to uh, discover. Um, and the last uh, Belgian beer style is the Saison beer, which is now really in, in vogue. Eh, in, uh, and that was a beer that was brewed in uh, south of Brussels, eh, in the, the province of Hainaut, uh, where the workers on the land in the summer um, had to drink some, something to, to not to dehydrate, eh? uh, but the, the beer was brewed in winter and the, the, the conservation techniques were not uh, as well developed, so it, it got a little bit infected and sour, and to cover up this, this sourness, which, which, which was actually, actually an infection, uh, they put a lot of spice into it to, to, to outbalance it. Eh? And now, fortunate for us, the brewing techniques and the conservation techniques are better, but the spiciness of, of, of saison which is a really good session beer, eh, is now uh, rediscovered, and that's really a good thing. So, um, about 2,000 beer, even more uh, beers, about 200 breweries. Why does such a, a small country does have all these, uh, these beers and this diversity? Three main reasons. The city, the church, and the land, the agriculture. I'll talk about the church uh, right after this, uh, for, uh, about Trappist and, and Abbey beers. The city is, has always been very important in our regions. We have a lesser um, uh, relationship to central authority because in, in Flanders and in the, in the Low Countries in particular, we had many uh, oppressors, uh, the Austrians, the, the Spanish, the French, uh, the Germans uh, briefly, uh, and um, we, um, we referred our identity more to our cities, our medieval cities, 
than to the central government. I, I can say for at certain extent it's still the case, eh? <laughs> even if we are a small country. Uh, and so the, um, the carry-ons, uh, like you have one here uh, at Berkeley uh, campus, is really a symbol of that freedom of the city, uh, uh, relying more on its own than on other uh, central uh, rulers. And so to um, um, accentuate that identity of a city, beer was uh, brewed in relation to a city. Um, how, how, is, how, how can I uh, explain that from a historical point of view? When you were into the walls, into the city walls, you had freedom to uh, freedom to um, have economical activities, trade. Yeah, to, to trade. When you were outside of the walls, until the French Revolution, to brew beer you had to, be, to have an approval of the local bishop or the local count. Yeah? And in the cities you could do whatever you wanted. So beer was uh, uh, seen as a, an element of freedom within an, an, a, a city a city scope. Mm -hmm. And you have old references like uh, Rodenbach in, the, in, in, in Rousselaar, you have uh, Cine, uh, you have the Koning in Antwerp, but you have also uh, newbies like uh, Bruxelles Zot, the, 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 the fool of Bruges, which was um, reinvented, rebrewed only 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So it's an old uh, relationship between uh, city, freedom, and beer. Agriculture is, and, and this is, of course, responsible <coughs> for tens of, of beers, uh, for, for many, many beers. Agriculture is also very important, of course, agriculture is important for every beer, but uh, combined with the Belgian uh, way of doing, uh, um, you, we, we did a lot of bad things in beer kettles through over the centuries, I guess. But by putting everything that is possible into a beer kettle and to find out what, what worked and what didn't work, we did a little bit of, uh, of, of uh, investigation, uh, um, innovation, and we, we came to the really good taste. For instance, when we compare it to our German friends who have the Reinheitsgebot, the purity law, this is, uh, they are censoring themselves to uh, innovate with beer, eh, because you can, according to their law, only brew it with, uh, with yeast, with malt, uh, with water and with hops, and that's it. Eh? And we add uh, lots of spices, we add fruit, uh, for them, it's, uh, it's, it's totally not acceptable, it's, it's not beer. Uh, we add uh, different uh, types of grains and malts, uh, we blend beers, uh, we do whatever it takes to make uh, uh, the best beer possible. Uh, and so it's a little bit soft anarchy, uh, seeing what can work, what, uh, what doesn't work uh, throughout uh, the ages, and that's why we got where we get. And of course, uh, I'm coming uh, uh, to the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, I have to tell you something about the, the role that the church has played. I'm going to start with the Abbey beers, because it might surprise you, but the Trappist beers are more recent than the Abbey beers. Abbey beers existed from, uh, let's say, the years 600, 800, when the first, ab the first abbeys uh, began to, um, to um, uh, evolve in, in uh, Western Europe. And um, it, it was not as romantic as it seemed. They, they, uh, they brew Abbey beers because the water was not always reliable. Eh? And, and you have for, to brew beer, you have to cook the water and you are certain that it's uh, healthy. But there was also an element of politics and policy and even police element. The church was uh, intervening and the monks were in the, in the different abbeys to control alcohol uh, production. Uh, that was a time when uh, the Roman Empire had collapsed, but there was still not a stable um, um, element in, in, in Western uh, society, Western European society. So there was a lot of violence, uh, tribes coming through, going mm -hmm. from the, the north and the east to the south, uh, and drinking uh, <laughs> and pilling uh, a lot. And so the church, the monks tried to get hold of um, this, um, yeah, let's say, this, this anarchy by saying, okay, we are going to control the, the, um, the, the alcohol policy. We are deciding when we brew, when we drink, and when you can drink it. They also uh, took a chance to, and this is not an anti-religious statement, eh, but they also took a chance to uh, shift uh, the brewing from a female perspective to a male perspective, because until the monks, brewing also in our uh, regions was, was a female activity. Why? The bad uh, uh, explanation is that 
it was a kitchen activity for women. But the good one is that uh, people at the time didn't um, uh, understand why there was alcohol in the beer. Eh? They didn't understand that the yeast dropped out of the, the air, came into the, the liquid and transferred uh, the, um, the sugars into alcohol, the sugars of the grains. Eh? And so they thought that women can, could give birth to real life, to, eh? and they could also give birth to, uh, to beer. Eh? <laughs> so, yeah, it, was a, it was more a mystical period eh? in our more rational approach, and certainly at a university campus this might uh, mm -hmm. sound rather bizarre. And so until a certain moment, uh, the women were controlling the, uh, the beer uh, industry, if you can call it that way, until the monks came along and they said, no, the women are, uh, are impure, are not pure, so they, they should not brew beer. We will take care of that. Eh? And so there was also, uh, uh, an, an early Me Too shift eh, uh, of the beer uh, industry. And then for, for centuries on, the abbeys uh, continued to brew beer, some of them uh, almost continuously uh, since, since a thousand years, but most of them, had, uh, certainly with the French Revolution, but also before and after, uh, quite long periods where the abbey was, for instance, destroyed for political or other anti-religious re reasons, and so, so they had to build up each time the, their abbeys, their monasteries, and uh, also take up or not the, the beer production. And in fact, the abbey beers now, most of them, are uh, contract brewed by a private brewery, uh, but under license of, of, the, of the monks. Eh? And still 10% of the, the benefits goes to, um, to charity. So if you drink an Abbey beer, a Belgian Abbey beer, you're sure that you are doing a good work eh? so you can, uh, your mind can be at ease. <laughs> the Trappist is a more uh, complex um, um, story. Uh, in fact, it only started after the French Revolution. And this is, it is a really bizarre story because there were monks in Normandy, in France, in La Trappe, which is an actual place where you can still go. And you know the French revolutionaries were not very keen on, on, on religion. Eh? And they uh, tried to smash uh, everything what, that, that, that uh, even came close to a church. And so the monks flew to um, An Antwerp where they would take a boat to go to, um, the, let's say, uh, Quebec yeah, in, in, in Canada. But because of the political instability at the same time there, uh, the boats never came. They, they, they couldn't uh, catch a plane, let's say. They couldn't catch a boat. And so the Bishop of Antwerp said, if you want to, you can stay here, but maybe not in the city of Antwerp. But there is uh, 20 kilometers uh, east from Antwerp some uh, pu pure gr uh, uh, poor ground that you can work on, uh, where you can do some agriculture. And the monks said, well, we might just as well stay here, and they, they, they uh, created the uh, monastery, the Abbey of Westmala. And it was really the mother brewery of Trappist breweries, because all of the others, Rochefort, uh, Chimay, Orval, and Achel, were, uh, were all um, created by the monks of Westmala. Only the, the, the famous West Vleteren Abbey is a little, uh, the same story, but in a sm on a smaller scale. The monks on the, the Mont des Cats, uh, the Katzberg, uh, flew all so from the French revolutionaries and they <coughs> went just 10 kilometers further to West Vleteren where they, uh, they created a refuge that afterwards became also uh, um, a, con uh, a continuous uh, a brewery and a monastery. So you see, uh, it's interesting to, to, to see that, in fact, we, we, uh, owned, we, we uh, owe the French uh, and the French Revolution a lot because the Trappists uh, are really in an historical connection uh, to that. To brew Trappist beer, in contrast to an Abbey beer, you have to brew it uh, by, done by monks or under their supervision within the walls of the monastery in accordance with the religious um, um, nature of the building. Yeah? Some of the, the actual um, breweries of the monks are becoming that big that they want to, to stop. They put a cap on their production because they say we want to stay a monastery with a brewery and we don't want to become a brewery with a monastery. Yeah? Uh, and that's what West Vleteren does and then uh, Orval, uh, for instance, and uh, that's why you, it's hard to, to get them, even for us in Belgium sometimes, eh, West Vleteren. And the fourth element is uh, all of your benefits has, have to go to charity. So for a Trappist, your mind can really be at ease. Eh? And, uh, <laughs> they, they, they do it uh, for good words, and they still do. Eh? So it's actually not a marketing truck, but uh, the, a marketing element, but it's something that they do.
Okay, now I come to the conclusion of my uh, short and brief uh, lecture. Um, I started with uh, a picture of uh, Bruegel and I, I stopped uh, with, with, with the same thing because I want to stress this little guy in the front. Eh? In fact, this is the peasant wedding um, next to Brussels. Eh? The, the old barn is still existing there. If you have the opportunity to, to visit it, it's, it's absolutely possible. And the main scenery is the, the marriage, eh? uh, where you can see the, the groom and the bride, and are they happy, not happy, it's not quite <laughs> clear to see. But this guy takes all the attention, and the nice thing is, you don't see his eyes, you don't see any uh, emotion, because his, his hat or his cap is much too, too, too big and over his eyes, but you can see the pleasure, you can see the, the, freedom, the freedom, the anarchy, he has already put his... Uh, finger into uh, what what go what uh, how do you, would you call it rice pop rice uh, rice porridge rice pop it's rice porridge uh, with with sugar uh, added and that is for me uh, really a synthesis of what the the Belgian and the Flemish because there much there's much overlap there uh, nature uh, is all about when it comes to arts and the other uh, view of the artist when it comes to brewing. Um, the, the, the quite free way of brewing and trying a lot of uh, things and seeing where, where we can get and at the same time creating balance because if there is one element that is uh, our secret eh, apart from diversity, apart from tradition, apart from the historical elements that I gave you that is that um, it's not difficult to create a sour beer you just put a lot of aggressive yeast in it it's not difficult to create a hoppy beer. You just put hop into the beer as much as you can, to a certain point. It's like putting uh, pepper or salt in a soup. Everyone can do it. Eh? <laughs> but it's much more difficult to get balance between the ingredients and to make a beer where there are many ingredients uh, present, but uh, there is not one ingredient that, tooks, that takes the overhand on others, where everything is melting into each other. And I think this is our little secret that I... Uh, like to share with you today so uh, thank you for uh, your attention and I'm uh, of course willing to answer to some uh, questions thank you